So it's turning into a jungle back here. Really, really nice. And the comfrey's getting big. So we're gonna start our soil building into the pond area. I'd mentioned before um, in one of my other videos, I think it's called like, this soil sucks. Um, when they dug the pond out, it was basically just pure sand because it was actually, you know, the dirt that was underneath the topsoil, it was like the dirt from six feet down, that ended up on top in some spots. So um, we mulched it, we added our own compost before we planted our plants, we did that in a wide area around the trees. But now we're gonna start our chop and drop um, soil building for that area. And we're gonna start using some of this super, super fertile four-year-old, five-year-old, food forest area and the comfrey is a great nutrient accumulator so we're going to collect it cut it off it's perfect timing to do it I'll explain why and we're going to start building soil over in the pond area all right so the comfrey has jumped up it's actually crazy this area has really jumped up just in the last couple days but I guess it's just everything leafing out it's all it was all there and invisible and I kept telling people there's lots of plants in here but you know, you can really start to see it now that it's coming up. Um, but the comfrey is actually starting to flower. And that is exactly why we're gonna come in now and we're gonna do a cut. Okay, so just in this area, let's kind of count them. We got one, two, three, four, five, six. We're gonna cut the rhubarb as well. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. And then back here, we got 12, the rhubarb, say 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And there's kind of a couple plants in there, but it's all roughly the size of one. Say 1920, and that's the front end. Now also keep in mind, I've planted comfrey into this whole swale at the front edge, because it's gonna act as a soil stabilizer. So you see it coming up places like this, it's already popping up. Um, right here, it's already starting to pop up, uh, but the whole front edge of this swale is also comfrey. There's some in here, I did it on the back end, but they're obviously not big enough to harvest. We do have one back there, so the back end has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let me just jump over here. So, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, and you can really see it's really starting to flower. 14, 15, that's like two, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Maybe this one will do as well, 24. And there's some more up here. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. And we might do some of this mullen here so we've got roughly 30 plants here we've got more down in the lower area more in the back side but this area here i know is hyper hyper fertile with these swales there's so much nutrient i know when i cut these down they're going to bounce right back no problem they're very 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 strong robust systems they're about to flower so let's talk about that a little more in detail Okay, so all plants go through certain cycles and perennials especially have their own unique cycle um, because they got to store energy down into the roots. So at the end of the season, they take all their leaf energy and they jam as much of that energy down to the roots. And that's the leaves basically drying up and turning brown. Then you can cut that back. All that's left in the cell walls of the plant are basically just like empty hollow carbon chains. And that's why typically brown grass is carbon heavy and green grass is nitrogen heavy. Now at the beginning, say when you just cut grass, it'll turn brown very quick. It's still fairly nitrogen heavy, but over time it'll get more and more brown. It'll get more and more carbon heavy because the nitrogen's being off-gassed into the air and decomposed by the soil microbiology and all that. Now in the spring, the root system provides all the uh, power, all the uh, sugars and um, nutrients to, to shoot up new leaf growth. Then once the photosynthesis starts happening, the plant's totally cool again, very, very strong. So this has been happening for about a week now. I'm actually surprised how quickly these have grown. I should probably, I don't know, wait a little bit, but I know comfrey is, like comfrey is a weed to most people, so it'll be totally cool. I wouldn't do this with a more finicky plant. Comfrey, no problem. 
then once it's leafed out, it's going to push a lot of energy into making genetics. So passing on its offspring for the next season, making flowers, and then eventually after their flowers are pollinated, making seeds. If you want to get rid of a weed, you wait and you make the plant spend energy on flowers. And then you cut it just before it turns into a, a seed. That way you've um, mined as much energy out of the root system as possible. And then you cut all the photosynthesis off. That's how you want to kill something. For comfrey, I don't want to kill it. So what I actually want to do now is before the plants start taking all that energy out of the roots and making flowers, I want to cut it now. And what that's going to do, it's going to send the plant back into its juvenile stage and it's going to start vegetative growth again. It's going to start putting out leaves again and the root system is going to be maximum strength. If I waited a little bit until this was flowering, then the root systems would be all that much weaker and my comfrey plants would have less chance of surviving a hard cutback. So right now is the optimal time to cut the comfrey. So I'm going to come by and we're going to cut it. So my favorite tools for using for this are um, a rice knife for smaller plants. Comfrey is a little too big. For comfrey, I have a hand half moon sickle that I really like. Both those tools I can't find anywhere. Uh, they're probably being returned to the earth somewhere in one of my gardens under like a mulch like this. They're probably in here somewhere from a previous chop and drop that I forgot them. So um, I'm actually gonna use a machete. So this is another tool. Um, what I like to do when I use a machete is obviously you can hurt yourself pretty bad if you screw up. So I actually like to cut away from myself at all times and make sure that there's nothing there that I can, I can hurt. That way, you know, and this is just a general good idea for kitchen prep or anything when you're using a knife is make sure the force that you're applying is away from, you know, fleshy bits that'll get chopped. So basically I'm just gonna kinda go like this. Okay, so I'm just gonna look around it, make sure that there's nothing in there that I like. This is basically just um, daffodils that are already done. So I am basically just gonna come down and we are going to chop it. Okay, and then we're gonna harvest all that and we're gonna mulch with it. Real quick point on this, because this comfrey it does have a deep tap root and it's getting most of its nutrients from deep down. It also, anyone who's ever dug up a comfrey plant knows that it also has lateral roots. They go quite, they're quite extensive. It's not exclusively a deep tap root feeder. So when I chop and drop this comfrey, I'm gonna take about a third or a quarter of the leaves and I'm gonna put it back down as mulch. And then the comfrey plants, the new ones will have no problem pushing up through that. But then at least some of this nutrient is gonna be returned back to feed the comfrey plant. Yeah, one more point. Anyone who's ever pruned trees, sometimes when you think you've cut a tree back too far or if you have to do a big cut on a tree, you wanna leave something called a nursery scaffold branch. So say I need, say I had a really, really bad area here and I had to cut it out and I had to cut all this out. And I say, say I had to cut like this whole branch off and most of this, I would do my best to save at least, you know, a branch here, a branch there, and maybe a branch here to um, act as a nursery branch. And what that means is that branch will at least have some photosynthesis to give energy back to keep the plant alive and st uh, stop it from getting into too bad of shock. So this is another option you can do with your comfrey is you can leave nursery branches up. So you can come by and when you're cutting it, instead of cutting it all, you know, make sure you get all the flower stalks off or else it'll go to flower even with one stalk. But then leave a couple leaves up and then those will act as basically nursery branches to get some photosynthesis to, you know, keep that plant alive for sure. Especially do that with smaller plants if, you, if you're a little worried about killing them with your cut. Okay, so there's basically the first 10 plants. So much organic matter. We're also going to talk about comfrey tea and how we can make that. We may not mulch this all, we might make some comfrey tea. Alright, so any kind of aeration will do. This is an ecosystem pond aeration kit, so I kind of need to get something like this for the winter time um, to make sure that I, I put a hole in the, uh, in the pond, which is sometimes in and itself an, uh, enough, but because I have such a big pond, I did want to get also uh, aeration kit that'll also help 
uh, keep the pond from freezing over, but also I can makes me uh, able to make comfrey tea and keep it oxygenated, which is super important. I'm always, always, always on um, aerobic microbiology is basically lying in the sand. Th those are the healthy guys. So the more oxygen you can get in, um, the healthier your micro uh, uh, microbiology is going to be. So um, this doubles as a function for making comfrey tea as well. So I figured I'd get this like a nice, good, powerful one. Okay, so real quick, um, we just have a sump pump that we're gonna, just a utility pump. So we're gonna pump that up uh, into the rain barrel up here. We wanna get some height so that we can automatically irrigate all the plants over here. I don't wanna put the rain barrel down there. I wanna be able to use gravity to kind of drip feed a line. So this way I can water directly with the comfrey tea if I want, or I can send it from, you know, this one into a mixing one, fill it mostly full with water and then put in a little bit of comfrey tea and then water from that. Okay, so next you're going to want to get an old pillowcase. Um, and the idea is that you could just put the comfrey right in the bucket, um, but you actually want to make this easy to pull out down the road. You don't want, um, you know, decomposed piece of comfrey plugging up lines if you want to tap straight into the barrel or anything like that. So it's just, I mean, it's just easier to stick it inside of a pillowcase. All right, so then you're going to strap that puppy nice and full. You're going to pack it very, very full. And then you're going to just basically tie it in a way um, that'll kind of stop it from sinking down and maybe opening up and everything falling out. And I'm specifically using um, pond water and not uh, tap water, hose water from the house because I don't want filtered water, even though I have a, I'm on a well for some reason they hooked up my water line, the outside water line to be filtered. So I want high nutrient. Um, this is, you know, very, very well oxygenated water from the waterfalls. So I'm inoculating this compost tea batch with uh, life. Very, very oxygenated bacterial life. And they will basically ferment this, but in an oxygen um, heavy way. So let's hook up the aerator. Okay, so now we've hooked up the compressor. It's all very ugly now, I'll hide it all. Let me say that, and we are gonna drop that right to the bottom. Now this one actually, let me pull this up. This one is nice because it comes with these diffusers. So this means that the water at the bottom is gonna be percolating up from a greater area. So I'm gonna try to lie this flat across the bottom. Feed a lot of that hose in and get it to lie down. And that's it, Diego's cooking. So the reason why you want oxygen. Now the reason you want the air in there is because again, the, good, the line in the sand between good guys and bad guys is oxygen. They're either aerobic or they're anaerobic. And most plants and animals have evolved, especially trees, to grow in forests. And in forests, there's deep, loamy soils. Lots of oxygen can get down to the roots. So um, the bacteria that they've evolved with is very aerobic. Swamp plants might want anaerobic bacteria, but that's pretty much it. Everything else wants aerobic bacteria, including us, including human beings. We're spaceships carrying around bacteria, but healthy bacteria, aerobic bacteria. So. Um, we want to oxygenate our foliar feed, feed. This fertilizer acts as either just a soil nutrient to water your plants with, uh, like an inoculation of life um, and nutrient, um, but it's also a foliar feed if you want to boost the plant up in a specific time, you know, just before fruiting or whatever you want, um, to maybe give it extra strength to build extra thick cell walls so that the fruit that they make is thicker and more resistant to pests. If you want pest control, that is my kind of pest control, make healthier, stronger plants. So we're gonna use this foliar feed, oxygenated foliar feed as a 50-50 nutrient boost to our plants, and then a microbiology, an aerobic microbiology boost to our plants, especially down in the pond area, down here where, yep, down here where, um, where we have basically dead soils. So we, excavated for the pond. Look, the kids are swimming. It's like eight o'clock at night, they can't get enough. So we 
excavated for the pond and built the hill out and the uh, the soil that we used was basically just dead sand from under the topsoil like feet and feet and feet under the topsoil no life in it at all so we're going to use a nutrient boost with a uh, microbiology microbiological kick to it and that's the comfrey tea it's got to be aerobic uh, because we want that healthy beneficial bacteria in our soils go diego go okay now we're going to start just dropping some of that comfrey down one thing i did think about these pawpaws actually is that pawpaw is an understory tree It'll fruit at the edge of a forest, but it really wants to be in shade. And on this hill, it's like full sun. So there's a chance that these things really burn up in the next couple days. I'm going to really watch them. Um, and I can always kind of prop some of these up and kind of give them a little bit of shade. Maybe I'll put a chicken wire fence around them and kind of prop up and give them some dappled shade. They'll do just fine like that. Maybe give them uh, a little bit of time outside of the sun. So just another thing that I might think of doing. So if you see wire cages around some of these plants, that's, that's what I'm thinking. These are going to be great here in a little while. But for now, um, it might be a little too much sun. That one's doing, looking like it's doing really well. A little bit of yellowing the leaves, which is understandable. There's no nutrients in the soil. That could be a nutrient deficiency, a small one. So anyways, we're going to go around and we're going to start building some of this soil up. So we're going to start mulching with some of this comfrey. All right, so four wheelbarrows full. Um, this row has basically, basically been harvested, but there's a couple weaker plants up here that I wanted to just cut the flower heads off, treat them like a strawberry, where uh, in the first year or so, I just want to cut the flower heads off and get them focusing on roots and leaves. And then the other ones, I'm going to treat them like asparagus. If you remember my asparagus tips, that is that you harvest, harvest, harvest while they're young, early in the season, and then you let them grow and do whatever they want to do um, for their full plant cycle. Um, and then that also keeps them healthy and strong for the rest of the year. Especially this area for here, uh, for me, I didn't cut this, uh, I haven't mowed this grass yet today. I did the rest, or my son did the rest. Give credit where it's due. Um, so I do want to keep these grasses from creeping in to the extent possible. Like for example, right here, I'm going to actually clean up a little bit around this pear. There we go. Just opening some light up to it. There's some asparagus and garlic around actually. It's not just a bunch of grass and, and other random plants, um, and clover and other random plants. So anyways, I'm going to let the rest of this kind of leaf out because I do want this comfrey acting as a um, bear, like a sun shading wall for the grasses creeping in and also a rhizome barrier preventing the underground grasses like Bermuda grass from creeping in. So this will maybe be the last time I harvest this this season. I might do one more harvest um, depending on how well it does and how well it bounces back. And I'll take you guys back here in a week or so and show you how it's bouncing back. All right, so it might be tough to show it, but I got chop and drop comfrey under pretty much every single plant in this whole system from that back hill, down the back rock ledge wall, down the walking pass, every single little piece of creeping thyme and plant that I could has now got a little bit of fertility that's gonna decompose. All right, so it's getting late. I'm gonna head on in. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank you.